there is nothing like having a wonderful teacher and professor. Teachers and professors are the ones who help us identify our talents. They point us in the right direction and show us the way. Ultimately, teachers and professors bring out the best in us and help us to reach our fullest potential. Welcome to the Empowerment Zone with Ramona Houston where we zone in on black and brown relations and our journey to empowering our communities. Where would we be had it not been for those wonderful teachers and professors in in our lives? I know I can name some of mine. In Northwest Elementary School in Brownwood, Texas, there was my favorite teacher, my third grade teacher, Miss Bobby Nuss, first grade, Miss Grady, my PE, teach, PE teacher from first to third grade, Miss Blackwell, Miss Big Stone, my fourth grade teacher, and Miss McAllen, my fifth grade teacher. I can re- remember all of them. And in undergraduate, there was Dr. Alma Williams at Clark Atlanta University, Ms. Rosalind Arthur, Dr. Betty Clark, and at Morehouse College, Dr. Marcellus Barksdale, Dr. Harold Braithwaite, and so many more. And so I believe all of us need to acknowledge and celebrate our teachers and professors, especially those who made an impact on our lives. So today, we are going to talk to Johnny Lee Lane one of the nation's foremost college percussion instructors. Professor Lane served as a professor of music and director of percussion studies at Eastern Illinois University for over 28 years. And at Eastern, he developed one of the finest total percussion programs in the nation. Prof Lane also spent three years at Indiana University School of Music at IUPUI and two years at that historically Black college and university, Tennessee State University. Prof Lane is the former director of education at Remo, and now he's a professor at Butler University. For over 13 years, Professor Lane was also the host and founder of the United States Percussion Camp. This camp was a total percussion camp with over 300 students and 37 faculty members. Lane and the camp also appeared on ABC's Good Morning America show in 1996. As an educator, Professor Lane has influenced musicians all over the world, and I'm honored to have him to join us today. Hi, Prof. Lane. Welcome to the Empowerment Zone. How are you doing, Dr. Houston? Man, Prof, I'm so glad to have you on the show. Yes, I'm I'm excited. Uh, I uh... I've been looking forward to this for a long time. Well, I'm so glad, you know, um, you're one of the great educators of our time, uh, in it, particularly in music education. I know uh, you taught my husband, uh, Terry Angulli. Uh, you also taught my um, brother, uh, Cecil Houston, and you also taught my brother's best friend, uh, Miguel Gaetan, who is a professional musician now. And, um, you know, it, it's, you just had an impact on the family clo- close, closely, but I know how much uh, you have impacted others uh, in music. But before we get uh, started on this great topic uh, in terms of talking about your legacy as an educator and talking about the status uh, of music education in the arts today. Why don't you just introduce yourself to the audience and tell us a little bit about you personally and professionally. We wanna hear a little bit about your background. My, my audience always likes to connect with the speakers by first hearing about who they are. Yeah, well, yeah, I was born and raised in Vero Beach, Florida, which is a great city down there in South Florida. Uh, my early musical training, uh, um, basically started out as a singer, a gospel singer, you know, by the time I was three and four years old, I was singing gospel music and um, my father was a gospel singer. Um, 
And uh, so uh, my musical training was already intact uh, with the singing the voice and so forth. And then I started taking piano lessons when I was uh, in third grade. And uh, that was the key to bringing out the total music uh, in my body besides the singing. You know, I had theory, ear training, uh, playing the piano, classical piano and stuff. And uh, uh, that happened all the way through until the time I was uh, got to seventh grade. When I got to seventh grade, I knew um, by the time I uh, got to seventh grade, uh, it was time for me to select the drums. That's the instrument that I wanted to play. Uh, I, had, I had some other options, but uh, I met my cousin uh, who's in the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame, uh, j uh, uh, you know, 50 years with the Allman Brothers Band. Uh, and uh, when I met j and I saw him playing drums every day, he was probably five years older than I was. And um, he was already in 11th and 12th grade, already playing with Otis Red and Joe Tex, uh, James Brown, everybody in the South, anybody traveling through Mobile and Gulfport, Biloxi, uh, New Orleans, and all up in there, they would pick up J-Mo. And, and, uh, and he, you know, he was on the road to uh, Sledge, uh, Ted Taylor, a lot of the great uh, R&B uh, groups. And um, when I met him and saw how he was so dedicated to practicing, I mean, every day. I mean, we were on vacation in Gulfport and uh, for two weeks and uh, for two weeks, I'm in the living room and watched him practice. Wow. I mean, I asked no questions, nothing. I just <laughs> soaked it in. Uh, I just couldn't believe that this guy was not going out to play baseball like everybody else. We were running and playing baseball and all that. And I got the nickname Night Train Lane. And uh, <laughs> like, I really fast. and uh, but I, I gave it all up just to watch him. Uh, for two weeks, uh, all day and all night. And uh, um, that was my motivation to go back. Uh, and when I selected the instrument, it was percussion drums. And uh, I was on my way then. I continued, my, my parents said, you okay, you can play drums if you want to, but uh, you go, you're gonna continue with the piano. So I had to continue with piano uh, all the way through high school, uh, junior high and high school. And uh, and drums was just uh, the other thing. and. I got to be so into it and I worked very hard to get to a higher level by the time I was in ninth grade. By the time I was in ninth grade, I could read everything under the sun. I could play everything under the sun. I can, uh, I, I was just all into it. My voice had matured and uh, I'm, I'm, a, I'm, a, I'm a great fan of the great Sam Cooke. I was uh, singing all the Sam Cooke songs and uh, both gospel and uh, pop. pop. And, uh, that just took me to another level. By the time I got to 10th grade, my band director, who was Lawrence P. E. Trapp, um, he um, basically um, said, there's a camp you need to go to. He came over and talked to my parents. He said, Johnny needs to go to this camp. And uh, it was at the, at the University of Kansas, um, hmm. the Midwest Music and Art Camp, we had kids from all over the United States there. Um, and it was six weeks long. Wow. Yeah, six weeks, I mean, six weeks long and uh my parents agreed that that's where i need to go and uh and i was so excited i mean i was nervous at the same time you know i'm, I'm meeting people mostly non-african americans uh gonna be at this camp and i had never been around african americans uh i mean uh, um i had not not been around uh whites and up i was i had this legacy and everybody knew about me um uh, because of uh, the newspapers I mean, people writing articles and stuff about me and he had this winning all these awards and stuff like that and uh so i was kind of nervous but when i got there i found out that i was i was on the right track and uh and um so six weeks in 1965 six weeks in 1966 made an album every week uh we had guest conductors every week with the concert party bands uh, I took theory, I took conducting, I took private progression lessons. And that was that was a, a super, I had never had private lessons before. I had never had private lessons before. So it's my band director and uh, and just meeting other people who were good at what they were doing. And uh, they just, hey, this is how you do this, this is how you do that. And I said, okay. And I would go back and practice like crazy. But um, that was my biggest claim to fame to want to be a musician. Uh, go to college and major in music was those at those summers at, at the University of Kansas in Lawrence, Kansas, uh, at the Midwest Music and Art Camp. 
uh, which does not, I think it exists today, but I think it's like one week. Six week things off the charts. Stayed in the dormitories, had my, my parents paid extra money so I could have my own practice room. So I got had my own little practice room when people used to keep at the, through the window and just watch me practice. They knew I was going to be practicing. After all the rehearsals and classes, I was going to be practicing. Had my own room, had my own key, and so forth and so on. And so that was truly special. So it was it was after that last camp, I knew I wanted to major in music, go and major, go and make major in music education. First, even though I was a great player and all that, I just figured I needed that education background just in case happened and I have to teach on the, on the um, uh, um, secondary le level. And uh, I knew I didn't want to teach uh, in junior high or high school. I knew I wanted to be a college professor. I mean, by the time I got uh, started my senior year in high school, I knew I wanted to go somewhere and progress or that goal of being a college professor. And uh, that's what I did. And um, uh, I started out in Southern for the Texas Southern my first year, and uh, they didn't have a percussion teacher. And uh, I was kind of upset about that, but the guy did his best. And uh, I had to get out of there, and I went to a school called Southern University, uh, in, uh, audition Southern University, because I, I had heard they had, had a percussion ensemble that traveled all over the state of Louisiana. Uh, when I got to Southern for my interview, I had no idea they had a marching band. <laughs> I, my my thing was they had a full time percussion teacher. He was the uh, Mr. Dillon was the first full time percussion teacher in the state of Louisiana on the college. Level. And uh, uh, this the guy at Texas Southern was telling me that he, he knew all most of the faculty there, and he said that they have a traveling percussion ensemble, and uh, they travel all over the state, and perform, and all that. And that was my focus. I mean, I I had no idea. I mean, I had never seen, I heard of Southern University having a marching band or nothing like that. I knew about Brown and I knew about Florida and them. All of, all of, those are the only two bands I had seen. And uh, um, I uh, uh, basically um, was shocked when they told me that uh, you had to come for pre-drill. Pre-drill? What's, what's, what's a pre-drill? Oh, you come two weeks before. Marching band come two weeks before. Said, marching band? Then I said, it was a big picture behind the director's uh, um desk he said that's my I, I thought that was michigan state i saw that <laughs> <guess something. laughs> so they got a big old band like that at that time they were 192 on the field wow. yep and uh it was one of the largest hbcu mm -hmm. bands at the time mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. for a couple years and um uh, and i went like uh, to be in the marching band <laughs> Yeah, that that, that that set my history uh, on because not only was I a serious percussionist, I was actually in the marching band and uh, everybody had total respect for me. Uh, they knew I had studied with the world champion, Frank Austin, and, and uh, everybody wanted to, to get what I had and uh, I shared everything uh, with uh, everyone. And uh, so that started my undergraduate. And then I got my master's at Southern Illinois University. One week after I graduated from Southern, I was in graduate school. On the wow. Beach. Mm. Yeah, I had to go home, drive home all the way to Bureau Beach, repack, and then drive back to Illinois. Mm. I started uh, in June of 1971. So I've been, I graduated from Southern uh, 50 years ago. Mm. This is your 50th time. class reunion. Wow. Yeah, June, just this past June, June mm. 2nd, June 3rd, uh, I was uh, uh, 50 years. Graduated from Southern. And uh, I, I feel blessed because, you know, I'm still around and, and uh, still motivated and I'm, I'm, I'm ready to take on the world just like I've always done and uh, uh, ready to continue to train and teach and, and so on, even though I'm retired from college, from full time college, I teach part time at Butler University here in Indianapolis. And uh, as a matter of fact, I was over there yesterday. I teach on Tuesdays over there, cushion on some of the night, uh, concert tonight. So, after I leave you, uh, uh, I'll be headed that way uh, in a couple of hours after that. But uh, um, every, everything is just from there. And then after I graduated from Southern, Southern Illinois University, uh, Southern Illinois University, I, uh, one week after that, I got the job at Tennessee State. Mm. Uh, everything was a one, I was a one week plan. So <laughs> one week after I did that, <laughs> one week after I did that, that that's how it happened. So what'd you and, do uh, at Tennessee State? 
Well, but see, I, I, I wasn't going to Tennessee State. I, I, I interviewed for, uh, here I am, just finished my master's. Uh, I interviewed for Western Michigan University. I didn't get that job, but I was a finalist. Mm -hmm. so I was 22 years old, 22 years old, young whippersnapper, ready to take on the world. And um, uh, I almost got that job. And then I went to University of Wisconsin, Milwaukee. Mm. And I got that job. Hmm. And I was like, oh, my God, I got a college teaching job. <laughs> I was like, oh, my goodness. I mean, I had to compete for it, you know. And uh, it, they were really excited about having me come there and, and also play in the symphony, the Milwaukee Symphony. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and then after I, I'm, I'm already thinking about going to University of Wisconsin, I started getting these phone calls from Tennessee State University mm. every day, sometimes four and five times a day. Mm. How bad they wanted me to come. Tennessee State. And I just kept saying, I already have a job. I mean, I just a contract to go to uh, University of Wisconsin, Milwaukee. And uh, they said, oh, you got to come here. And, and nobody in my town would agree. My, my counselors at high school, where I graduated from, my band director, everybody wouldn't agree with me going to the University of Wisconsin, Milwaukee. I thought I would go have some support there. And everybody kept saying, you got to go to Tennessee State, you know. HBCU, they need people like you, blah, 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 blah. You're young, you're excited. You, you, you're you going to do so much with an HBCU. And so um, so I ended up on the Tennessee State on a Greyhound bus. I didn't mm. want to drive anymore. On a Greyhound bus to, to check it out. My parents said, go check it out. Because I couldn't eat, I couldn't sleep, I couldn't do anything. Because I had two jobs, two people. Come, Tennessee State calling me every day. I couldn't eat. And uh, and I get there, and, and I, I just remember being in the vice president of academic affairs. He he laid out a contract for me. <laughs> <laughs> like, you, 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 can, you can sign this. I go like, here I am, a young 22-year-old whippersnapper. And uh, uh, here I am presented with another contract. I've already signed one. And, uh, and here I am uh, in that office. And uh, I said, what about the University of Wisconsin Milwaukee? The chairman of the music department at that time said, I'll take care of that. I'll take care of that. Just sign the contract. So like, oh, boy, I'm like a big brainwash. <laughs> and I ended up signing the contract in the office. Then I, and I, he said, come to my office. I'm going to type up a letter for you, and then we're going to mail it off. And then I remember the letter. It said, due to the circumstances, he typed it up. He typed up my letter that I was going to send. So he, typed, he said, due to the circumstances, I cannot fulfill my duties as the professor of percussion at the University of Wisconsin Milwaukee. Uh, thank you so much, Johnny Lee Lay. <laughs> and uh, <laughs> and he, he put the stamp on it. He put the address. I mean, he addressed everything and he sent it off. And I knew I had to go back. I got on the Greyhound bus, went back to uh, Bureau Beach, and uh, I knew every every time the phone rang. This is before voicemail and all this kind mm -hmm. of stuff. Every time the phone rang in the house, you got to pick it up. And uh, I say, I know they go call me. I know they go call me. Please, uh, please just let them see the letter and they say, oh, he's not coming. No. This guy, Cameron Reese probably called me up and he was screaming at me. I cannot believe. I mean, he was just all over me and I was about to cry. I was crying. Like, I say, I just can't. I, I think I made up something like, oh, I'm going in the military. <laughs> I'm going in the military. And, uh, and, uh, and that's how it happened. And I ended up going to Tennessee State in 1972 uh, as the first full-time percussion professor at Tennessee State and assistant director of band uh, uh, for those two years. It's very interesting on um, your trajectory, how much uh, your family, uh, your friends, uh, your parents helped to to really shape who you are as a musician and an educator. And when you look at that camp six weeks long, I mean, who so. I, got the, I got the albums over here. Um, I still have like six albums for 1965, six albums for 1966. That I mean, is amazing. The greatest band literature you've ever heard. We had some of the best, uh, band conductors from all over the country, uh, even some symphony conductors like Harry John Brown from Milwaukee Symphony. He would go Milwaukee Symphony before I even thought about Milwaukee. And um, 
and uh, uh, con uh, playing under Russell B. Wiley, who's the director of bands at the University of Kansas. And uh, you know, Dr. Foster uh, graduated from uh, University of Kansas for his undergrad. So uh, he, he was already a legend uh, by the time I got there in the summertime. Everybody knew who Dr. Foster was. And uh, um, uh, so I was just uh, moving right along. So and, uh, in, in those camps, when you look at, you know, the fact that this is your first time being around non-African Americans and being exposed to uh, a cultural and educational experience that you had never had before. Did you feel when you were around your colleagues as a musician, were you competitive? Did you feel like you were competitive? competitive I found out I was, yeah, I found out I was very competitive. I mean, mm -hmm. as a matter of fact, they looked at me like, I <laughs> know this guy can play piano, plays drums and percussion, plays mm -hmm. symphony. I mean, you know, I mean, it, it, it was, it was, um, it was so unique. We had so much respect, you know. And uh, and I, 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 at that time in 1965, you know, I was 15 years old. Mm -hmm. So in 1965, uh, I just felt like I, I know what I want to do. I, I can see end of the tunnel. I know mm -hmm. where I have to go mm -hmm. and I know how I'm going to get there. And then having those private lessons for the first time, you know, and somebody said, hey, yeah, you need to get these books and these books and these books. And here we go, you know, and teaching me. And then I go to my practice room and practice. And and I, I had never seen a marimba uh, when I went to uh, University of Kansas. I think I, I got a picture of me and people go, hey, can you say me? <laughs> I got a picture of me standing in front of marimba mm -hmm. with some big old 3S drumsticks. <laughs> and and I'm going like, and I look at the picture now, you know, I go like, can you imagine if I had decided to strike that instrument with a wood, wooden stick? <laughs> yeah, I am. I don't know anything about the marimba. I see the marimba. <laughs> I'm up there because I can play piano. I'm up there. There's a picture of me standing there with my drumsticks uh, in front of the marimba as if I was going to play. But I think it was a steel picture where I just had that <laughs> <laughs> You know, and that's a sad picture because I'll be, I never saw one of my students. Uh, <laughs> one of uh, you know, and uh, so that was, it was a true blessing when, especially when I went into conducting classes mm -hmm. and the theory classes and things like that, I started to soak in all of this stuff that I, I felt, this is what I need. This is what I need. This, this is this starts my journey on this, this, this incredible journey that I'm going to have to take. And it starts right here. And um, going back to the second year, I mean, I was like a, a rock star. Well, you know, that's the whole thing about, um, you know, you talked about you knowing from a very young age what your gift was and what your passion was in the career that you wanted to go into. And that's why it was so important for you to have parents and educators and people around you showing you that way on how on on how uh to become an expert in your field and a lot of times young people don't have the exposure they need in order to help them create the professional careers they so desire so now i i didn't uh i know that one of your legacies is the United States Percussion Camp, which you created at um, Eastern Illinois University, I believe. And I know for a fact uh, that my husband was, uh, somebody encouraged him, Terry on Gully encouraged him to go to that percussion camp. And he told me that it was at that percussion camp that is where he decided that he wanted to be a professional musician. I don't know if he's ever told you that, but he said that was the moment because he ended up seeing all of these um, uh, professional musicians who had made a career out of music. And he said, this is what I want to do. My brother, the late Cecil Houston, my little brother, for his birthday, since it was so influential for my husband, I ended up when my, my, for one of my brother's birthdays, that was his birthday gift from me to him was sent him to your camp. And he I was, when you came. I saw you. 
for the first time. Yeah. And so he was so mesmerized by the camp and it really influenced him to become a music educator. He ended up majoring in music and becoming percussion in- instructor and everything and becoming a band director. He also the following year influenced his his uh, his best friend, Miguel Gaetan, which I told you is a professional musician to come to the camp as well. And that just shows you those are just three people I know. But th- that you, your one of your legacies is that U.S. Uh, United States uh, Percussion Camp. I think that was the official name, right? United States. Yeah. Uh, un- so can you talk about your conceptualization of that camp and why you decided to start the camp? How long did it last? What did y'all do there? Okay. Well, I tell you what, people, people asked me about that camp. And I said that that camp was uh, visualized in my heart and soul by the time I got to the 11th grade. Wow. Because after I had gone to uh, that Midwestern Music and Art Camp and stuff like that, I said, one of these days, wouldn't it be nice to have something like this, but just percussion with mm-hmm. everything? Mm-hmm. And uh, so I, I, I had it already in my head. You know, I went all through graduate school and I mean, undergrad and graduate school. And uh, I had already taught at Eastern on how many years um, to, um, from 1974 to 1987. But I created the camp in 1986 to start in the summer of 1987. Mm-hmm. So all I did was visualize what I had already perceived in my mm-hmm. brain, in my mm-hmm. heart, mm-hmm. that this is what I wanted. I wanted a camp where it was all hands on, nobody sitting around and just taking notes and watching somebody do a clinic or something like that. Uh, I wanted to be a boot camp for professionals. Mm-hmm. And that's how I created that United States percussion camp. Started off with about seven or eight staff members. Um, first camp was about 30, 40 students. Um, ended up with a camp of uh, 37 faculty members and uh, 300, over 300 and some kids from 40 states. Wow. And so um, that, was, that was that dream. It went from a small camp to a very big, huge camp with all the major co- percussion companies supporting it so not just my endorsements but every company wanted to be involved and send instruments and equipment we had millions and millions of dollars of equipment shipped in all them semi trucks coming in uh <laughs> before the camp it was unbelievable and it was all hands-on in order to have all hands-on you can't just have a set of comments mm-hmm. you had to have 20 cents mm-hmm. you had to have mm-hmm. a, a room full of uh this and that and then another room, and then another room. We had three three rooms of uh, uh, hand drums and stuff like that. Um, two big old rooms of uh, marching percussion. Uh, three big old rooms of uh, mallet percussion, fully equipped with everybody. 15, 15 people in the class. Uh, 15 people can be playing at the same time of doing what they're supposed to do. Uh, rolling, since two rooms are rolling, you know, mm-hmm. but you can uh, look at with a teacher's station that they can. Uh, um, have 15 students in the class and uh we had all kind of classes in you know, drum set class. we had 60 drum sets that last camp wow 60 <laughs> drum sets that last camp all the bass drums and stuff muffled and everything and uh teachers had their sets and we had sound system in each room that um and um uh we had some of the best teachers in the world uh teaching in that camp and uh and a lot of people stayed with me the whole time. People like Andrew Chancellor and uh, Marvin Sparks and Marvin from was the beginning and plans to Dr. Williams. And then we f- brought on Lewis Nash and, and, mm-hmm. uh, and Julie Spencer. And uh, it was just, you know, just fully Steve Howden, uh, just so many people um, being involved with the camp as teachers. And mm-hmm. I had it set up as, as a very, very, successful camp where we didn't want any kind of trouble. We had rules and regulations. And we had three rules. We had, and number one was um, the boss is always white. I would say <laughs> rule number one, the whole camp, 300 some kids would say, the boss is always white. <laughs> I said, rule number two, the boss is wrong, see rule number one. <laughs> rule number three, to be early is to be on time, to be on time is to be late. Mm-hmm. Rule mm-hmm. number four, we enter to learn. I mean, mm-hmm. this is like <laughs> people come in the first time and they would hear that 
and see how strong them kids sound, mm -hmm. and, uh, and they, they believe in it. You know, because I would get over there at seven o'clock in the morning, and kids' classes started at eight. Kids be they had their breakfast and everything. They're so excited. They, they already get there early, and they know not to go in the room. Mm -hmm. All the rooms are open now by then. Mm -hmm. You can't go in the room unless the teacher's there, mm -hmm. unless the teacher invites you to come in. Mm -hmm. But you can't go in the room and start beating on drums and all that kind of stuff. No, everything had rules and regulations, and uh, everybody followed the rules. And we didn't have any problems uh, in 13 years of doing the camp. Camp started in 1987. The last camp was 1999. Mm. And uh, <clears throat> um, we won Good Morning America, uh, ABC, in 1996. And I was nervous. I mean, I couldn't even remember my name when they said. <laughs> so, I said, "My name is." <laughs> my name. Yeah, they, they take two kids. <laughs> Finally, I calmed down. Everybody said, "Calm down." Calm down. <laughs> and LP has sent eggs, so every all three hundred people and the staff had egg shakes. Wow. We had done a little routine, you know. And so finally, finally, when I get out there, uh, and uh, and I, I finally I said, "We would like to say." Morning, and it was mm -hmm. the whole camp said, Good morning, America. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I, oh, I still have the video of that. Uh, Charlie Gibson and uh, what's the lady name? Uh, uh, I can't think of her name. They had, Katie, uh, huh? Was it Katie? No, no, this is the first lady. Uh, oh. she's very popular. Um, with Charlie Gibson, and and uh, she they said she reached after the after, after we had done the thing, the video shows, uh. <laughs> Russian camp with all those people. Mm -hmm. Oh my goodness! Mm -hmm. It's like being in a room with a whole bunch of jackhammers. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I got that. I got that old tape, and I go mm -hmm. and try to get say, "Yeah, I guess so." Mm -hmm. and, uh, uh, it was just so uh, amazing that camp. We had all the right classes. Uh, Tears take seven classes a day. You required. If you were a drum set um, uh, track, you you had three classes of drum set, and then you had to fill it in with uh, two other uh, two or three other mm -hmm. classes, you know, mm -hmm. like swag drum or malice or timpani or hand drum, Latin percussion or whatever. And uh, <clears throat> but the total percussion track, you, you took all seven classes, mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. then we had the night clinics and concerts, and um, we had uh, all star marimba orchestra, Vicky Jinx. Uh, was the conductor of that uh, all-star marimba office we met every day at, right after the last class so at four o'clock uh that we were setting up in the concert hall for the marimba all-star marimba orchestra and they, they they did a big concert uh at that saturday as we were closing out and, so uh, what is go ahead excuse me go ahead. so it was just it was just so neat i don't know how i pulled it off for 13 years but i did so what do you feel like is your legacy from that uh percussion camp because I everywhere I go, I meet people. Mm. I've met lawyers and doctors who said, Probably, you don't remember me, but I was at your 1990s mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. percussion mm -hmm. camp, but I, I still play my drums and stuff, but I'm an MD. Mm -hmm. I'm mm -hmm. a lawyer. Mm -hmm. uh, I'm a professor and I'm teaching percussion at this school and mm -hmm. that school. I mean, it was, I mean every every time there's a percussion convention, PAS, because of our society convention, or if I'm somewhere, I'm I'm in an airport. And I had some people, they would see uh, me with something like this, and uh, they say, oh, and the parents would come to me and say, are you Professor Johnny Lee Lane? Like, <laughs> yes. Oh, my God. On our refrigerator, we have the rooms. <laughs> like, yeah, we want the rooms. The boss is always right. I say, oh, my goodness. And my son is so in. He's still in. He's, he's working on a degree in percussion, blah, 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 blah. You you changed his life and all that kind of stuff. I'm, I'm walking through. I was I was in uh, Charlie, <laughs> and I was uh, going to my next gate, and somebody saw me, and I had you know I had lost my hair. I, you know I, at the beginning I had a big old curly fro, and uh, uh, they said you look just like Professor John Lee Lane. Like, yeah, <laughs> yeah, well you know your rules. My brother had T-shirts. Uh, I mean he had stuff made where it had those rules on it, and I just thought there was something he came up with. I didn't know he was uh showboating your rules. So that's that's <laughs> so. And he always had his percussion 
a per per percussionist and his bands to follow those rules. So that that's 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 a legacy in, indeed. So now when yeah. you look at um, the music education today, uh, it appears that you know when it's time to cut budgets, we always seem to cut the arts and the music in music education. What what is your um, take on that and what would you suggest that people do who are advocates of music and the arts for one thing without music you know it would be so many people lost you've got to have music and music education going on whether the kids gonna major in music or not is so important in, in their livelihood and uh for you to say that you're gonna cut this because you you you're running out of funds or something like that that's the one thing you need to keep those music education students do well proven that they do well in math and english mm -hmm. and, and and other courses because they are in music mm -hmm. and have so much discipline you know mm -hmm. in, the, in the marching bands and the concert bands orchestras and the choirs and, and all that kind of stuff so it's 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 devastating to me even here when people are about cutting this and cutting that cutting the music programs and stuff like that these kids need um music education and, and, and these ensembles and the and, and trainings and stuff like that in music because it's going to make them a better human being and they're going to do well uh and be totally organized to move forward in their careers whatever they want to go in it makes no difference you're not training music edu music education majors you're training music students mm -hmm. in whatever they want to uh succeed in and uh um it's, 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 it's like a, a motivating thing. They, you find people who play all those years in band and even go to college and play in band, but they don't major in music, but they, they continue their thing and then they, then they get out and they're professional, um, whatever they're gonna be, a, a computer scientist or whatever, and they still play their instruments. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and, they, and, they, and they turn it on, turn it on their, what they know, the young people. And then those young people are, are ready to take off too and, and, and to get motivated. Private lessons are so important. Yeah, you're and, so uh, right. The research does show that people who are in music, they do uh, very well in other uh, fields. And it's because of, like you stated, that discipline that they get from being uh, a part of music. Now, you also stated that you are a product uh educationally and professionally of an hbcu for our audience hbcu is historically black colleges and universities what advice would you give hbcus and their uh music education programs uh, they, they really have to stay on top of it i mean those we hear so much about the marching bands and we don't hear about those people that's in the trenches that teach in theory and get trained in music education classes both uh elementary and secondary music education classes, uh, uh, instrumental methods, and all those method classes and stuff like that. It's so important uh, <clears throat> for people to realize that it's more than than what you see. Well, most people, when they see a HBCU, they're looking at their marching band. I even had uh, one of the <clears throat> radio personalities um, uh, gave a scholarship to a student, and, uh, and, and they found out the student was going to go to an HBCU to major in music. And the first thing the radio announcer said, they have a great music department. You you gonna love that band. Mm -hmm. You didn't say anything about all mm -hmm. those people that are teaching all them courses to make you what you need to be. Mm -hmm. You know, they just talked about just the band. Mm -hmm. And um the band is a part of it because I marched all my years at Southern. And um and um luckily we had concert bands and percussion ensemble and all of that kind of stuff going on at the same time. And um they had a jazz degree, uh, jazz, uh, what they call the Jazz Institute at that time. Alvin Baptiste was the direct, <clears throat> director of the jazz, uh, jazz Institute. And we had great choirs and, and uh, piano majors. And we forget about the piano majors mm -hmm. and the uh, vocalists and people that's going to be uh, auditioning for the Metropolitan Opera. And, and I mean, these people were so good when I was coming up. I saw so many people. The practice rooms were always full. Mm -hmm. Always cool. Now we would be out there practicing in marching band, and then I come. I remember I had to make a decision, you know, because you know we we started band at four o'clock, go to six. They closed down the dining hall, and they open it back up for football and the and the band at mm -hmm. six thirty. Mm -hmm. 
Mm-hmm. So we would eat, we would eat, and then at seven, uh, seven thirty, we had to go back to bed with us. Mm-hmm. All the way to like 10 o'clock and stuff mm-hmm. like that. And I go mm-hmm. like, oh man, I gotta get my stuff together. You know, all for me to get my stuff together, I went to the percussion teacher and say, Hey, I need a key to the building. He said, Why do mm-hmm. you need a key to the building? I said, I'm gonna be over here at four o'clock in the morning. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. You're gonna come over here at four o'clock? I said, Yes. I said, You gotta make it happen. I said, That's the only time I can be focused and practice like I need to practice. So every morning at four o'clock, Campus security always had to, I had to show my card. They would always come in to see me, even though they know I'm the same person they saw yesterday. <laughs> uh, let, me, uh, let me see your pass, sir. Let me see your pass. Yeah. I got a key to the percussion room. And um, uh, every day at four o'clock to seven, three hours, solid, quiet practice, I did at seven. And uh, at seven o'clock, I went to take my shower. At eight o'clock, I was in my eight o'clock. And I never miss classes. I never miss classes. People sometimes will wake up and say, I'm not going to class today. Well, you're a music major. Well, if you you if you miss the music class and then you show up later, you go past that professor in the hallway or something like that. <laughs> <laughs> so he didn't come to my class. So he's he's he's, uh, he's going to bed. He's going to uh, uh, class that class. Okay, okay, okay. L, L. I mean, you know, that's what happened. A lot of, yeah, that's they, what they, happens they, at the HBCU. Wow. They HBCU, they call you out if you miss that class. Yeah, they'll call you out. I remember I was at Tennessee State in the hallway <laughs> uh, with Dr. W. O. Smith, a very famous uh, Dr. W. O. Smith. Uh, he's the he was the bassist on that uh, Coleman Hawkins tune called uh, uh, "Body and Soul." Mm. He's the original bassist on "Body mm. and Soul," mm. and uh, <laughs> and uh, we were sitting in the sitting in the hallway. And uh, and uh, Dr. O. W. O. Smith said, "Johnny, see that kid coming there? He missed my music, 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 uh, history class this morning. See what he's gonna say." So we stand there, we talking, you know, and the kid come back, "Hey, how y'all doing?" <laughs> <laughs> and Dr. W. O. Smith said, "A cut a date. We we'll keep the A, B, C, and D away." <laughs> I will never forget that. I will never forget it. One cut, B. Next cut, C. Next cut, B. I mean, he said that, and I, I never forget. It. And, and, you know, he said, Johnny, you know, we'll keep the A, B, C, and D away. I, I have never forgotten. It. And uh, yeah, so yeah, the, the, the HB, HBCUs, those teachers will come. Will, Oh yeah. Don't yes. go to the church. Yeah. Don't go yep. to the church. You go yep. to the church on Sunday, they'll call you and say, Oh yeah. Yeah. Thank you yeah. Lord, you're in the church. <laughs> yes. <laughs> in yes. Yes. That's the so, truth. That's the yeah, truth. They, you know, I say, you're not gonna make it. They'll tell you right up front. You're not gonna make it. And you get your act together. And you, and you really the good thing about me going to HBCU was that I worked my tail off. Mm-hmm. And I I I I'm I, I met so many great people who were in my same boat. And people always wondered why I wear, I, I used to wear a shirt and tie or a suit and tie every day. Mm. That heat in Baton Rouge. And I'm going like, I said, man, why you wear a shirt and tie every day? You're so clean. I say, I say, I'm training mm-hmm. to be what I'm going to be. Exactly. You know I mean, mm-hmm. I say, I'm going to be a college professor. I say, I don't want to get out of school, uh, get out of graduate school and then try to figure out how to tie a tie, mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. How, to, how, to, how to dress up like I'm supposed to. Um, uh, I'm going to do this now. So I'm in training. I'm just not getting paid. And that's, that goes back to just having standards of excellence, you know, yeah. and, and looking at your professors at HBCUs, they, you know, I always say that students perform to the level of expectation. So if you have low expectations, they're going to perform at that level. If you have high expectations and the expectation is that you're going to come to class, you're going to study, you're going to perform uh, to your highest potential, then students reach that level. And so, um, you know, that that's one of the great, I believe, great legacies of uh, HBCUs is the the, uh, levels of expectations that they have for uh, their students. But you're one of the great music educators of our time and you've had such a uh, impact uh, on uh, many, many people, professionals, 
uh, professional musicians, uh, educators. I know you're still involved with uh, the HBCU band uh, concert. I don't, I don't know what that organization is called, but I know y'all often come. HBCU uh, band directors consortium. Yes, uh, yes. That for the last, um, last, um, uh, maybe 10, 10 years. Or yes, so. band uh, band directors consortium. Yes. And so yeah. I'm, I'm just, I'm just happy that you would even take the time. Uh, to meet with me today, and I love that setup. All, all you got the congas. I'm, I'm looking. I know my audience can't see, but you know, you got this. Uh, got a set back there. I see all the music hey, and all the mallets. Yeah, actually, tell your husband check out my Indugu setup. My oh, that's Indugu. Oh, okay. Yeah. Indugu setup. Yeah. And I, all of y'all don't know Indugu uh, was uh, Michael play, played on that Michael Jackson Thriller album. Uh, right. uh, um, played set on that. So in in Google Chancellor, I see the congas, I see your marimbas and the uh timpanies back there. You got a you got a great setup at home. Well yeah, you know, I um I I, I built the dream home and uh in the dream home I said I got to have uh my big showroom percussion studio and uh an office complex. I storage too over here and uh so um that was all built in the house the beginning and watching it every day. I used to drive over here. Uh, I live over here by the airport. I live in Plainfield, Indiana, which is right by the airport. And uh, mm -hmm. uh, uh, I used to walk, drive after I talked during the day. Uh, I was at IUPUI in, in uh, Indiana University, Purdue University at Indianapolis for three years. And uh, <clears throat> I used to drive over here every day to see what work they had done. Mm -hmm. We had a schedule of what's supposed to be done each day. And, uh, and when I saw this room here finally built. I went like, yeah. That's it. That's it. Well, I love it. I love, I love your setup. But um, yeah. well, appreciate um appreciate you joining us today and and just I wish you the best as you continue to make an impact as an educator and, and a musician and and just as a person, how how you just really, really impacting uh, the the universe with your work. Thank you so much. I appreciate it. Thanks for the opportunity. And uh, I know you, you're you going to be uh, very successful with your podcast and, and everything. And uh, uh, tell your husband, I said, hello. He's my man. Uh, he's an awesome musician, awesome percussionist. And uh, I appreciate him so much. Thank you. Thank you. So Prop Lane, if anybody wants to uh, get in touch with you, how would they reach you? Well, they can they can reach me uh, through my email. It's Prof Lane forty nine. It's P R O F L A N E forty nine at gmail dot com. So now we're at our uh, college strategies portion of our uh, interview. Uh, Prof Lane, could you tell us uh, what school or schools you attended? What were your majors? and your degrees, and what strategy would you give students for college success? So my undergraduate degree was in music education at Southern University, graduated in 1971. And then I went on to Southern Illinois University for my master's in percussion performance and conducting. Um, <clears throat> I graduated there in 1972. And, uh, and then sometime uh, in 1975, <laughs> I started on my doctorate. DMA at the University of Illinois. I was in the first group of students accepted into the DMA program at the University of Illinois. And uh, <clears throat> I didn't finish that degree, but I went deep into it. And uh, um, that was pretty much my education. And then I started studying with a lot of professionals, like Alan Dawson, uh, Bobby Christian, some of the great uh, percussions uh, around them. And uh, but that was pretty much my uh, educational experience. And uh, uh, it meant a lot to me to progress the way I did and, and to understand, uh, to keep myself focused and, and so I can move forward in my career. I mean, I was, I'm, I'm a self-motivated person. Uh, I have, I, 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 I know exactly what I want and how I have to do it and what it would take. And I was surround myself with nothing but positive people. I stayed away from negative people. Negative people wouldn't 
they would they would see my defenses if they come around me. <laughs> uh, I don't take that. And uh, uh, I, I I wanted people who who even though they may not be doing what I'm doing, but they had the motivation to do what they were doing and they were on the right track, just like I was in music. And uh, <clears throat> that's uh, staying on that track meant a lot to me in my career. Uh, when you go into uh, HBCUs or any school, you got to go in with this, this idea that you're there to learn. You're there to learn. It means so much because if this is your opportunity, you got four or five years to get your act together. This is this is the go, go, go shape your your um, for the rest of your life. If you don't get it together, your undergraduate years, it's very difficult for you to get it together later on. You got to get it together. And while you're in high school, during high school, you got to start thinking about that too. Don't wait till you get to college or your second year, third year, and then you're trying to change your majors, change your majors, change your majors. Hey, be focused. Know what you want go after it, stay with it, and then move forward. And uh, <clears throat> uh, I, I, what I can say to young people is that if, you, if, you, if you're self-motivated, if you really have an idea of what you want to do, stay with it and go, go, to, go at it 110%. Mm -hmm. um, it means so much to me to see people so motivated. I see young people all the time, like the students that I teach here uh, at Butler, uh so motivated and uh it means so much even though they're not they're not after i do teach one african-american student um trying to get him motivated and focused on what he has to do and uh to move forward in the career and uh everybody it used to be the united states was like the number one uh, percussion country in the world we used to dominate everything everybody wanted to come to the united states to study nowadays and it's been going on for the last 30 years, is that anywhere you go in the world, you're going to find outstanding percussion. Asia, Europe, everywhere. I mean, these people, and they want what you want. Mm -hmm. So you you can't sit back and think that you're competing against people in the United States. You, you're competing against people in the world. Mm -hmm. Everybody want what you want, you know? And so you got to, you got to go the extra mile and, and and get to a very high level of whatever you you decide to do uh, in whether it's music or you know you know chemist or biology or, or lawyer or doc, uh, political scientist or whatever you know you you got to um, you got to stay focused and move forward and be the best you can be. That that is some great advice, uh, Prof. Uh, uh, focus focus, focus. Two, surround yourself with positive people. Number three, recognize you are in school to learn. Number four, go after what you want 100% because you're not just competing with people in the United States. You're competing with people in a global society. And finally, number five, be the best that you can be. That's great advice, Prof. Yeah, I mean it's simple. People, yeah. <laughs> how did you do? I have young young people coming to me and say, "How did you? Well, what should, how did you do, mm -hmm. get to be what you are?" See, I say, <laughs> "Yep, that's it. That's Focus. it. Focus." I knew what I wanted, and I had to stay on the track, good or bad. You know, mm -hmm. it was, uh, somebody wrote a uh, poem about uh, who was the uh, who, I think I know I was going for something. I can't remember who the Browning, one of the Brownings. Uh, mm -hmm. I can't remember, but it was talking about going down the rough road. Mm -hmm. Because the rough road is what you go have. You go have good times, you go have rough road, mm -hmm. you go learn how to get through that and then go on and go on. And then you go down this road here with all the lights and bridges mm -hmm. and everything is so clean. And then it stops. Mm -hmm. You can't go any further. Mm -hmm. but this other road, mm -hmm. you can continue to grow, grow mm -hmm. and move forward for the rest of your life. Mm -hmm. That's mm -hmm. the road that I do. That's great advice, Prof. Thank you so much. A special thank you to the incredible team of the Empowerment Zone. Terry Gully, theme song. Nad Works, digital support. And, of course, our featured guest. If you enjoyed my podcast, please subscribe. We are on all of your favorite podcast platforms. Be sure to rate us on Apple Podcasts, too. 
Thank you for your continued support.